Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the webinar, 30 Meter Telescope Site Characteristics, a comparative study of Mauna Kea and the uh, Rockulus Machachos. Uh, as most of you are aware, uh, Mauna Kea is the preferred site for TMT, uh, while ORM in the Canary Islands is our backup site. Uh, we're looking forward to discussing with you the characteristics of these two sites, uh, as well as provide an update on the project in the Astro 2020 process uh, in the US. Uh, we'll have a 30 minute presentation. Uh, and then after that, we're eager to hear your questions and concerns. Uh, so the presentations today will be led by Christophe Dumas, uh, the TMT Observatory Scientist, uh, and Matthias Schuch, the TMT Telescope System Scientist, uh, with contributions from Warren Skidmore, the TMT Instruments, uh, sorry, the Vice President for Community Relations with TMT, uh, and Warren Skidmore, the TMT uh, Instrument System Scientist, and Gordon Squires, sorry. Uh, mixing things up there. Uh, the panelists for the Q&A uh, from the TMT Science Advisory Committee uh, are Mark Dickinson from Noir Lab, uh, formerly known as NOAO, uh, Tommaso True uh, from UCLA, uh, and myself, Greg Herzig from Peking University. Uh, the panelists also include uh, Jessica Dempsey, the Deputy Director of the East Asian Observatory, uh, Mark Balcells, the Director of the Isaac Newton Group of Telescopes at ORM, and Romano uh, Karate, uh, the Director of the Grant Khan Observatory. Uh, a brief note before we begin, begin about the panelists from Mauna Kea and ORM. Uh, they're here to represent their observatories uh, and to help any, answer any questions on operating telescopes on Mauna Kea and ORM. Uh, based on their hands-on experience on the sites and in their communities. Uh, we hope to focus this webinar on the scientific descriptions of these sites. Uh, the social issues in Hawaii and Spain are complex, uh, and the presence of uh, the representatives from Mauna Kea and ORM on this webinar uh, should not be seen as taking any side in these issues. Uh, so with that, uh, welcome everyone to the webinar. Uh, thank you all for your interest in TMT. And with that, I'll turn it over to Christoph. All right, thank you, Greg, and welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for participating at today's webinars. I'm going to start sharing my screen. In case you don't see my slide, just uh, shout very loud. If I don't hear anything, I think it's fine. Um, OK, so before we start, I, I just want to share some logistical information with you. All the information you are going to hear today about the site uh, is actually available on our website, uh, and you have the address. Okay, so feel free to download the documents, and they have been updated very recently. Um, in addition to this, you will also be able to find a recording of this uh, um, webinar uh, sometime in the future when we have it available, and also a copy of this presentation. So all the slides that are going to be presented today. So. Um, in case you need to go back to this information later on, you can do that. Uh, Greg will be monitoring, uh, sorry, moderating this uh, meeting. So thank you, Greg, for doing this. And uh, he will collect your questions that you will ask, uh, preferably through the chat feature using Zoom. And um, you can do that anonymously or just to everyone, but uh, send your question using the chat feature if you can. Uh, and, and Greg will actually ask the question on your behalf uh, uh, when the, uh, you know, discussion, not the discussion, but when the presentation is over. Uh, of course, you will have also an opportunity to ask questions live uh, by raising your hand after the uh, presentations. Um, and this is the first, you know, webinar we're actually organizing, and uh, we thought it was a good idea to do that on the site uh, issues and uh, to provide you some update on the project as well. But we would like to do that more in the future, especially now that we cannot travel, we cannot organize uh, TMT forums uh, yearly as we were doing in the past. Uh, so, uh, feel, you know, feel, feel free to send us some, some uh, topics and ideas of uh, uh, discussions that you would like to have with us in the future uh, in such webinars. You can do that during the Q&A or by email, uh, email Greg or myself, okay, afterwards, it's fine. All right, so uh, this being said, I'm going to start uh, on my clock. I just don't want to go over the time allocated to me. All right, so the webinar, uh, the plan for this webinar is first providing you with uh, an overall situation about the site access. Then I will go through some uh, very quickly, so some slides about the Astro 2020 process and uh, a prospect to get NSF funding. 
Um, all of you are very familiar with Mauna Kea, um, you know, but not necessarily with La Palma. So I will provide a brief introduction about La Palma before I hand over to uh, Matthias, who is going to uh, go through the comparative studies that uh, we have done over the past uh, few years and months. Okay. So first about the overall situation with the site access. Um, as you know, you know, the timeline to, to get a permit uh, to build a Mauna Kea or La Palma, okay, um, uh, is taking some time, okay, that's not a, a fast process. So all of this was started for Mauna Kea in 2009, when the site was actually selected uh, uh, to be uh, uh, the site to build Mauna Kea. And um, so in 2010, there was an EIS, an environmental impact study that was approved. Uh, and uh, we finally got in 2014, the uh, construction district use permit released by the Board of Land Natural Resources of the state of Hawaii after one year contested case. In 2015, we attempted to uh, start construction on Mauna Kea, which was basically uh, um, opposed by uh, some a minority of the Hawaiian community. We could not start construction. Uh, we were asked by the Supreme Court of Hawaii to actually we do another contested case, which we did between 2016 and 2017. It lasted about a year and a half. And in the, uh, at the end of 2017, the Board of Land and Natural Resources reapproved our CDDP, which is a construction permit for TMT. Um, so year after, after uh, ruling on two appeals from the opponents, uh, the Hawaii Supreme Court confirmed that uh, the validity of our CDDP. And as you know, uh, it's going to be soon uh, one year anniversary, which is a sad anniversary, by the way. Uh, as you know, we tried in July of uh, 2019, on the 17th of July, to attempt uh, to restart construction again, and this was blocked uh, by our TMT opponents. Uh, now, currently, as it's uh, happening, we have several mediation processes ongoing, and their outcome is still uncertain, so I cannot say whether it will be successful or not. For La Palma, um, the process was a bit faster. It didn't take uh, uh, that long, obviously. In 2016, uh, the site was uh, selected to be the alternate site of the TMT. And then we got some uh, approval of uh, hosting agreement between IAC, which is managing all the observatories on La Palma and, our, and TIO. Uh, and um, uh, we went through another uh, environmental impact study uh, for La Palma, which was approved in November of 2018. And you know, about a year later, uh, we got some uh, e ecologist group, Ben Magek, who actually contested a chronogram uh, of the administrative process to, lend uh, to hand over the land where TMT will be built to, to select La Palma. So we had to redo one small administrative step that was redone, and in November of 2019, we finally got all the licenses to start construction. Uh, about a month later, uh, the same group, Ben Magek, also uh, filed an appeal against the land concession and uh, this process is ongoing and we expect to, you know, the process to be done in about nine months from now, okay? Just for information, uh, last month, okay, in June of 2020, Ben Maggett, which is basically a small group, uh, has also opposed other projects, uh, de development projects on the island, including the CTA project, which is a, a large array of 19 telescopes to be built on, on uh, La Palma, and uh, they just lost a separate appeal against CTA North. So, uh, where do we stand uh, no, regarding to polls? How does the you know, community feel about uh, uh, TMT being built in Hawaii or La Palma? Uh, we routinely you know, uh, run some polls through the community in Hawaii, La Palma, and I'm just sharing with you the latest ones. So for Hawaii, uh, currently we have about two thirds of the Hawaii residents, including all islands, not only uh, the, the island of Hawaii, but all of you is supporting the construction of the TMT, about a third is not, okay, is uh, uh, opposing uh, the construction. Uh, this is all Hawaii residents considered. Obviously, if you look at uh, um, uh, the demographic and uh, native Hawaiians only, uh, the kind of opposition we are facing is uh, uh, bigger than that. It's between 50 and 60 percent, uh, according to the latest polls. And as you know, uh, the issues in Hawaii are quite complex and multiple, okay? We are talking about Hawaiian sovereignty, uh, the use of the land, cultural and religious practices, indigenous rights, the management of Mauna Kea itself, and obviously environmental concerns. For La Palma, the situation is quite different, uh, and the recent polls are uh, showing us, uh, um, you know, uh, 
you know, people who are supporting the project uh, across all the La uh, Canary Islands to be about 95% and about 5% against. And the uh, issues over there are slowly, solely about uh, environment. So what's the timeline to start construction? That's the question, okay? I would like to get an answer to that myself, you know, and everybody who's working on the project uh, is asking this question every day. When can we start construction? Unfortunately, the world has changed, as you know, uh, over the past uh, few months. And due to COVID-19, even if we wanted to start construction tomorrow, we actually could not do it. Okay. Uh, so we don't want to put anybody at risk, any workers, anybody supporting the project uh, to social gathering or opposing it. Uh, so uh, we are not in a situation to start construction right away. Uh, also, um, as you're gonna see, okay, we are going through uh, uh, the decadal survey process and we have to wait until uh, the decadal survey, the aspect 2020 panels is actually providing uh, input and recommendation about the next decade uh, uh, projects okay, to be funded by NSF and NASA as well. Uh, so in terms of risk, uh, in a way there is still the risk of facing major protests, okay? Um, and as I told you, we are going through some mediation process, but we are not really sure about uh, the outcome of this uh, mediation process is yet. And in La Palma, ideally, we should wait until this uh, pending legal obstacle, uh, we are still facing an appeal over there, is removed before we start any construction. So at that time, I cannot give you a timeline to start construction, okay? Uh, what I can tell you is that it is uncertain and we need to wait. We are not ready to make such a, a commitment yet in any of these sites. One thing is sure is that once the construction is started, it will take about seven years uh, and then an, an additional about three years to go through some clinical and science commissioning. So first slide should be about 10 years after the construction kickoff. Quickly um, about uh, the US CMT project. Um, as you know, TMT and GMT are working together with NAR lab to offer a system of two telescopes, one in the north, one in the south, uh, to the US community so they can actually observe the full sky with extremely large telescope and complementary instrumentation, very powerful project. Uh, we are planning to submit a, a proposal to NSF. What we have done so far in February of 2020 is to make a presentation to the Astro 2020 panel on OIR. Uh, and now we are uh, preparing ourselves, okay, to uh, uh, make a full construction proposal uh, submission and NSF reviews that will actually happen after the ASTRO 2020 recommendation sometimes uh, mid-2021. Uh, Assuming obviously that the ASTRO 2020 recommendations are favorable because as you know in order to uh, trigger the funding process with NSF we need to be ranked at the highest level uh, and if this happened okay we could expect funding to start as early as 2023 and obviously US Congress we need to approve uh, uh, any funding from NSF. So if NSF funding is approved later on, TMT funding will be secure until the end of construction. OA will become a major partner and US scientists will have access to both GMT and TMT and TMT partners will have access to GMT through uh, collaborations as usual for any facilities. And Noir Lab itself uh, will work with us okay, to provide a common interface for all TMT partners. So briefly about La Palma before I hand over to Matthias. A quick introduction about the site. Um, there are several islands, like in Hawaii, uh, built up by some volcanic activity. The main difference is the location. It's on the west coast of Africa, northwest coast of Africa, and the altitude of the mountain are, is not as high as uh, Mauna Kea. Uh, in terms of uh, longitudinal position, uh, obviously we would still be able to provide some uh, 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 transient follow-up, okay, from any uh, uh, discoveries made by other facilities uh, sitting in Chile, for instance, like NSST or the EELT. Um, just to provide you with a snapshot of uh, uh, La Palma, uh, La Palma is the observatory of La Palma, which is called the Observatory of Rocky de los Muchachos, is managed by IEC. It was inaugurated in 1985, and only three years later, uh, they actually implemented some very uh, strict uh, regulation to preserve the quality of the sky above La Palma, it's a no-fly zone, no plane can fly over the observatory, and also the sky is protected against the contamination from light, radio sources. Uh, and so that means, uh, um, you know, the, the background, the night sky background is actually preserved and uh, it's, a, it's actually stable over the years. It's a, it's a very dark site. 
So ORM is international in terms of uh, a facility that it is hosting and all the partners that are keep uh, collaborating to operate these facilities. It's also hosting, you know, the largest, uh, today's largest optical telescope, can, uh, the GTC, 10.4 meter in diameter, and it's going to host 50 MRs, which is uh, 19 telescopes, okay, five of three, three meters and uh, uh, 14 of uh, 40 meters. And we've been working with the um, International Scientific Committee of IC uh, over the past few years. We're meeting twice a year. We're providing updates on the project. We've also been working, uh, doing some real work and working together with uh, uh, a few people to actually set up a laser traffic control system for ORM activities and requirements for it. So this is uh, an aerial image of uh, observatory rotated over the churches where you see TMT uh, on the right side. Uh, sitting at about the same level than GTC, and you see many other facilities being operated over there, including CTA, the first uh, uh, telescope for CTA. Uh, this is a family portrait of all telescopes and experiments being uh, operated at uh, the summit uh, with the partners involved. And on the bottom right side, you see uh, like the future projects, okay, like there is a four, four meter River Moon Telescope robotic telescope. Uh, probably ORM might actually be hosting also the equivalent of DECIS on the European side, it's called the European Solar Telescope, although the Heide Observatory is also considered for this. Obviously TMT might go there if we cannot build in Hawaii. And uh, there will be 19 telescopes for CTA North, as I already mentioned. So in the end, before I hand over to Matthias, why was ORM chosen for TMT alternate site? Well, two, you know, two points. One is about the science and site quality, we believe. We, we've been applying the same analysis method that we have done for originally in 2008 for uh, uh, to you know, select uh, uh, the prime site for TMT. And we believe that ORM can support all of TMT core science. It is clearly the best uh, Northern Hemisphere site after Mauna Kea. Uh, I'm not going to go through this table because Matthias will actually drag you through. And the other reason is uh, programmatic. Uh, this place actually offer a very strong uh, uh, synergy on the science side and operational side as well. Uh, if you know, TMT is built in La Palma, we will have a technical operation on the island of La Palma and uh, we'll be actually be sharing a, a very large facility with other observatories, uh, which we'll have access to. We actually do not have to build anything, we will already be built. And uh, uh, we would have our science operation in Tenerife on the IAC campus to provide some scientific synergies with the uh, researchers over there. And both spaces have immediate access to the airport next to them. It's only the 1.5 hour door to door uh, uh, transfer between uh, Tenerife and uh, uh, La Palma. So this being said, I'm handing over to Matthias and I'm going to stop sharing and you can, turn, you can you know, start asking your question, obviously, using the chat feature. Thank you, Sim. All right. Um, hello, thanks, Christoph. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining. I'm Matthias Schuck. I'm one of the system scientists uh, in TMT, together with Warren Skidmore and until recently, Anshal Otterola. And I'm going to do part four of uh, this presentation about the site characteristics. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about the sources of the data that we have for Mauna Kea and ORM. I will start with a summary of the main site characteristics and then go into details on the individual parameters, turbulence, water vapor, uh, mid-IR performance, and then a word about extinction and dust. And then I'll finish again with a summary uh, of those main characteristics. All right, so where do our data come from? Uh, as many of you know, probably, uh, we did a pretty extensive uh, site testing campaign back from about 2004 to 2009. And we have from 2005 to 2008, we had uh, equipment installed on a site called 13 North uh, on Mauna Kea, which is a little bit below uh, the summit ridge, so you can see Subaru, the two kegs, that's Gemini, IRTF, and CFHT here. And so we had uh, some of the equipment that's shown here. The, the centerpiece is a mass dim telescope that's a turbulence profiler. We also had acoustic sounders there that uh, did a high, high resolution, low elevation turbulence profile. There's a weather station here, of course. Uh, 
There was other equipment there. One thing you couldn't see on the previous photo, there was a sonic anemometer and a dust sensor up on the tower with a mass dim. Uh, we had water vapor radiometers, all sky cameras there. Uh, we did not have a 30 meter tower on Mauna Kea uh, uh, for permit reasons mostly. This is a picture from Amazonas, uh, the site of uh, where the EEOT is going now, which uh, again, many of you might know was one of our candidate sites in the early days also. Um, data from uh, ORM. So Christoph showed this picture already and I wanna highlight a few locations here because I'll come back to them. So this is the proposed TNT location. The Grand Tecan is over here and you can see they're pretty close and in a rather similar situation. Um, a lot of our turbulence profiles actually come from the Jacobus Captain telescope over here, JKT, which is a distance away, uh, but uh, uh, we still believe they are pretty applicable for the most part, and I'll say much more about that in a moment. And then there's another site called DHV here. That is where the EELT did its site testing uh, with a mass dim. Uh, so I will come back to that. So we, ORM was not one of our candidate sites in the early days, but there were, there's a lot of data available for it anyway. So the, the IAC sky quality team has been taking data at, um, at ORM for more than three decades. And they have made everything available to us that we asked for. And we've, we've done a lot of that again, I'll come back to that. So this is uh, just for reference, if you look here, north is kind of to the bottom left and this uh, photo while it is straight up because this is a map here. So the TMT site is over here, DHV is there, GTC there, and JKT over here. Uh, but you can see all these colored dots are places where site testing has been done. Um, so there's really a lot of data available and just to put this in the same orientation, this is roughly, this is the caldera edge here up there. And this, this is how those are oriented. Okay, so I'll say more about some of that later. I have, uh, this is the slide that Christoph showed already earlier. And I'll just go really quickly through these numbers and then have detail on some of, on many of them afterwards. Um, one thing I want to mention, because we often get asked, how does that compare to Amazonas, the EELT site? Uh, we also have the numbers for Amazonas here from our own site testing. Uh, but Amazonas is not, there was some confusion previously, that Amazonas is not a candidate site for TMT at the moment, obviously. So they are just here in case there are questions about that, and I will mostly uh, yeah, not talk about those. All right. So Mauna Kea is higher than ORM by 1800 meters. Uh, that's known and that's the difference. The usable time fraction is 72% based on our best estimate for both sites. Uh, seeing turbulence related parameters, which are these ones. So there is a, is a bit of a difference, not a huge difference, but it's, it's a difference in the seeing from the 60 meter above ground level. Uh, but that's actually not the most important thing. Mostly what matters for us is AO performance, and I'll come back to this. But one thing you can see that this, uh, the parameters that are uh, uh, determined by the high altitude seeing are very similar between Mauna Kea and ORM, and in fact better than Amazonas and many other Chilean sites. And that's a known property of both Mauna Kea and ORM that they have weak high altitude seeing, which is important for AO and an MCAO system. Uh, water vapor, of course, uh, Mauna Kea is much higher than ORM, so it has a higher fraction of, of dry conditions. That's just how it is. Uh, uh, water vapor is essentially a function of altitude. And then because of the altitude difference, uh, the temperature is also a bit higher. Um, at ORM, and we'll come back to that. And then the ec atmospheric extinction on average is actually very similar. Uh, there's, a, again, I have a slide on that at the end. I also want to point out that our Japanese colleagues at NO, N, NAOJ did an independent analysis of the ORM site data earlier this year, and they found, uh, they confirmed our results that we found. So that was a, was a they did a 
a lot of work and a very good job. And it was nice uh, to see that they arrived at the same conclusions as we did. Okay, turbulence profiles. Um, for the analysis that we are de doing, we need turbulence profiles, not just integrated seeing as it comes from a DIM. And that one reason for that is for AO performance analysis, especially since uh, TMT will have a first right MCAO system. Uh, it's also important for the estimation of the seeing at 60 meters above the ground, uh, which is the quantity that we are using for the most part. Uh, the reason for that is that 60 meters is the height of the TMT enclosure and compute, we've done uh, very extensive computational fluid dynamics simulations that show that the turbulence below that that TMT experiences is dominated by the enclosure and the telescope and not by the outside turbulence. And we know there are some people who think those CFD simulations are maybe not quite reliable enough yet or not confirmed enough yet. Uh, and maybe more is entering into the dome. Uh, and while that might affect the performance, it's not anything that will make a difference for the site decision between uh, Monarchia and ORM because the ground layer strength is the same. It's 0.63 for one and 0.64 for the other. Um, so if more enters, then we are currently assuming that's the case for both Monarchia and ORM. All right. Turbulence profiles, as I said already, for Mauna Kea, they come, they are our own mass dim data. At ORM, there are two large sets of data. One is a G-sider, a scintillation-based turbulence profiler that's at the JKT site. Remember in the photo that was kind of off to the left at the caldera edge. And then the EELT site testing, which also had a mass dim. Um, and that's at the DHV site, which is much closer to the um, to, to, to the TMT side, but I'll, I'll get into those two data sets in, on the next slide. Uh, I want to point out we have looked into a property of both of these data sets carefully uh, and a lot of other data sets also with a lot of help uh, from the ISC sky quality team. So uh, they've given us when we wanted reduced data, they've given it us to us. When we asked for raw data, they've given it to us. They've spent a lot of time explaining everything to us and, and doing extra analysis. So this was, was really great uh, support we've gotten from them. And then of course, I already mentioned, we also had a collaboration with our Japanese colleagues uh, earlier this year. Uh, that was also very good and along the same lines. Right, so most the data, the results that we're using are mostly based on the GSIDAR data. And that's simply because there is a five-year coverage of that data set. And as I said, we need profiles. There are some disadvantages to that, of course, and that's uh, because we had a mass dim at our site. So we would prefer to use, in fact, the mass dim profiles, but the problem is they cover a much shorter period of time. Um, they are between nine and 18 months, depending on which slicing, which aspect of the data you're looking at. And um, I have a table here with statistics of total seeing, the 60 meter and up seeing, and the free atmosphere, which we define as the mass seeing, 500 meters and up. Uh, the number I've shown you before is this 0.58 arc seconds. The total seeing is 0.82 from the G -sider. Uh We believe that to be a, a based on our and all the analysis we have done, uh, this is very likely a somewhat conservative estimate, um, all of these numbers. And one re uh, if you use the EELT mass data, they get a 0 0.7 to 0 0.8 total seeing and a 0 0.31 free atmosphere seeing. A lot of the dim measurements, are, uh, that there's a lot of dim data available, including a long data set at the GTC side, which you will remember is very close to the TMT side which has 0.65 arc second total seeing and other data sets which range anywhere from 0.6 to 0.84 arc seconds. Um, and just to make that clear, the numbers took, these are total seeing numbers, so they need to be compared to that number. And as I said, this is one of the reasons, not the only one, why we believe this estimate is uh, conservative. All right. After all of that, how do, how do the sites compare? I've already shown you, starting with a table down here, the median 60 meter seeing comparison. One thing, you sometimes hear people saying, but the bad seeing tail at 
either that side or the other side is much worse than at the other end. I've heard, I've heard it both ways around. Uh, and if that's why we have the 75 and 95 percentile numbers on here, and you can see those are pretty much identical. Um, the free atmosphere seeing from our own data is 0.34 at Mauna Kea, and um, it is 0.4, my cursor keeps going away, sorry, 0.4 arc seconds from the JKT SIDAR and 0.31 uh, if you use the mass dim data. If you look at the distribution throughout the year, so here green, uh, green is Mauna Kea, the dashed line is the median, and purple and the solid line is ORM. And they are very similar most throughout most of the year with uh, somewhat of a different difference maybe in the early part of the year. But then what matters really is, is uh, AO performance rather than the seeing itself. And I, I have the profiles up here. I'm not going to talk about those just for reference, except for one point. Uh, Mauna Kea, which is blue and ORM have very low um, high altitude seeing compared to many other sites, Amazonas is shown here. And that has an effect on AO performance, uh, especially at high zenith angles. So AO performance, uh, strail ratio for the, the three colors, are, uh, are the three sites. Um, and this is J, H, and K band. And you can see this, it's, it's very similar. The only real difference is uh, Amazonas, which because of the higher high altitude turbulence uh, has uh, a less, uh, less of a, a, a lower strail ratio at high zenith angles. If you look at the ratio of the uh, strails squared between Ora and Mauna Kea, which are the solid lines down here, and that's uh, a measure of the integration time you need to get the same signal to noise for background limited point sources. Uh, you see those are very stable and very similar, all above 90% and above 95%. Here, this is the curves of Amazonas uh, to ORM. Uh, and you can see again the effect at high zenith angles. Uh, not, not that that's where we will observe very often, but uh, it's, it's just, uh, I'm just pointing that out to, uh, uh, to, to explain what's happening here. Um, so this is the difference due to AO performance only. There is of course a difference because of atmospheric extinction and background. And if you look here, the blue lines are 25 condition, 25 percentile conditions. And this is the ratio of integration time needed taking of AO performance, extinction, and atmospheric background into account. And it's about uh, 10 to 15 percent in the best position, uh, conditions that you need longer at ORM than at Mauna Kea. And it's somewhere in the 20 to 35 percent for median conditions. But what I want to point out here, this is mostly due to the background. Uh, it's not AO performance. AO performance is really very similar. Okay, water vapor. I spend a lot of time on turbulence because people often want to know about that. I'll go through the other stuff uh, somewhat quicker. Uh, water vapor, uh, that's the, the water vapor, there's a real difference because of the altitude of the site, as I already said. Um, Mauna Kea has a median value of roughly two millimeters, and uh, Oraham is a bit more than four millimeters. Uh, the monthly distributions are shown here, which actually show very similar interestingly very similar conditions in the in the winter but then in the summer uh, ORM has a lot more water vapor. The amount of time that water vapor is better than two millimeters is 20 percent at ORM and that's important um, because we mostly where this matters is in the mid-infrared and TMT is only expected to do about 10 percent of its observations in the mid-infrared and uh, there are 20% of the time available with uh, this two millimeter, but below this two millimeter threshold. And in fact, the red line here is per month, which fraction of time there's available below this level for at least two hours continuously. And it's above zero. It, it happens all during all times of the year, a lot less in the summer, of course, 
for them in the winter. But as we have adaptive scheduling, uh, we'll have adaptive scheduling and water vapor is actually comparatively easy to predict. Uh, we will be able to make use of the best conditions for that. Um, this is a, a plot again of the added additional, additional exposure time you need at ORM compared to Mauna Kea in different uh, mid infrared spectral bands. Uh, this takes AO performance, atmospheric extinction and background and the telescope background into account. And again, with uh, flexible Q scheduling, we'll be able to um, uh, make use of the best conditions here. And then there is a difference. Yes, ORM is not as high as Mauna Kea. There's just nothing we can do about that, but it is not, uh, it's, it's, well, it's up to you to decide whether you think this is large or not, but it's, it is definitely not a huge uh, uh, increase of the exposure time. The science is still possible. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. It just, it will take a little longer. And then finally, uh, we hear a lot of anecdotes about dust uh, and extinction at ORM. And yes, there are dust events. They're called Kalima uh, and they typically happen in the summer. However, in our analysis that we've done, uh, the usable time analysis that we do already take, oops, what happened? Uh, there we go. Uh, takes high optical extinction or high dust concentration of the ground into account. Those are included in our usable time analysis or not usable time rather. Uh, just the same way how as tropical cyclones and cirrus, which happen at Mauna Kea, but not at ORM are taken into account there. And this, so taking that into account, the usable time is 72% at both sites. And finally, the average extinction um, there is, we've used ATC telescope data for more than three decades and the average extinction at uh, KB extinction at uh, ORM is 0.13 uh, and it's 0.11 to 0.12 median. At Mauna Kea. And yes, there is in the summer, this line is the summer curve. Uh, the dotted line is the uh, all usable, all, all data, all year long data. Uh, there is more data, more time with higher extinction in the summer. But the overall curve for the whole year is, is actually not that different between the two sites again. All right. I'm finishing with that slide. I'm not going to go through the numbers again. Uh, so that's a small part of the analyses we have done and um, uh, how we arrived at those. Thanks a lot, everyone. Uh, we appreciate your participation. And please do let us know if you have any uh, further questions.